Well, thank you very much. What a church. And I sensed that as soon as I got here and we came early. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I have the exact opposite personalities. And so when we got here early, she reminded me that we were here early. And, uh, and that's not on the schedule to be here early. So uh, anyway, we're going to have a fun time this morning talking about how different she and I are. And, and, uh, and yet we've been married 49 years this week, <laughs> September 5. So you didn't see, I don't think you've seen my lovely wife yet. Could you just stand and kind of wave at everybody? <laughs> this is the last thing she likes to do, but. So, yeah, we, um, we have had a very, very exciting life and very different. And, and um, she is, um, she's actually uh, so different than me in personality that she gets energy from routine. She likes a minimum of changes and routine in her life. She just loves it. Who has a personality like that? How many of you are like that? Okay. Almost always you marry somebody like me who gets energy from change. Amen. So as many changes that I can have in my life, uh, the happier I am and exciting new things and so on and so forth. So anyway, I, uh, I love that. And she's the exact opposite of that. So the reason we have 65 books is that we have been in 6,500 conflicts together in our life. And we just take our mistakes that God helps us figure out how to get out of this mess. And we write about it. And people love to read about our messes and our goof ups and, and how fouled up I am as a father and, and a husband and so on and so forth. And I just uh, go before the Lord every day and say, Lord, here I am. I am what I am. I'm flawed without you. And so, Lord, thank you for saving me and then refining me and giving me wisdom over the years. And how do we get wisdom? We go through trials and we figure out what to do. And God shows us and we get out of it and then we write about it. So you could be writing about it too. And you know what's very, very fascinating to me and wonderful reality is that <clears throat> when I was growing up in school, I was a horrible student. And I didn't know at the time, because at my age, nobody ever tested these things, but I was dyslexic and ADHD. And so uh, that was a real hindrance as a student, because you can't concentrate and you're distracted by everything. And I was the class clown and you know just all that stuff. But I failed the third grade. It was a little bit embarrassing. It was a small town. And, but uh, <clears throat> there was actually three different grades in, in, in a room. And so it was a pretty small place, but anyway, I just felt and believed in my heart that I was stupid. And the teachers helped me uh, reinforce that uh, belief and <laughs> spelling tests and reading and all that stuff. You know, I used to be horrified that somebody would ask me to spell something. And so anyway, I'm just horrible at spelling and reading and uh, math and all that kind of stuff. But uh, <clears throat> I'm actually, and this is really important to understand about me, I'm actually on a sixth grade level today, academically. So when I went through school, I really had to have a lot of help and tutors and just, I got to know every teacher when I was in college and graduate school, because I never planned to go, that's another whole story in itself, but, but I f learned uh, quickly that if you get to know a teacher really well, and you help them and get excited about them and tell them they're an awesome teacher, <laughs> that you get higher grades. <laughs> so um, I know it's probably a teacher, you're probably a teacher, and so unfortunately, uh, but anyway, uh, but okay, here's the key to this thing. I was very embarrassed by that, but God gave me the dream when I was like 35 or so to someday write a book about what I was learning about my relationship with my wife and marriage and family and three kids. And I didn't have a clue about how to be a father. She was the awesome mom. And uh, I was trying to learn all that stuff. And, and so, but my kids really helped us parent them because we used to say, we don't have a clue how to parent you. How would you like to be parented? You know, <laughs> they're pretty sharp. 
because they know how to be loved, and uh, they taught us a lot of things, and uh, we're all in great harmony today still. From time to time, we fall out of harmony and so on and so forth, but, but we learn how to get back in. And so, but here's what's important. As God supernaturally opened the door for me to write a book, share verbally what I was learning, and then somebody else helped write it down and stuff, uh, ghost writers and stuff. But as he opened the door, that was him that opened the door. All things are possible through Christ who strengthens us. Because I didn't have a, I, I said, God, if you could do this before I'm 60, you know, I'd be thrilled. But it was two years where he brought all five of my dreams into reality. And I've lived off of his dreams that he gave from, from my early 40s. And uh, always very aware that, that it's, it's his will and he opened those doors and I don't have anything to do with it. But here's the important thing. Guess where the best-selling books Guess what level those are written on? Sixth grade level. And I'm there naturally. <laughs> so that my job has been just to dumb down the books I get back from editors and ghostwriters and stuff like that. Because I really write to myself. And I know that if I'm interested in the chapter, because I have to redo every chapter you know, 50 times until it gets to the place where I really can understand it. And if I get it, and if I understand it, then I know most people in the world will get it. So that was a blessing where it was a curse to me for a lot of years. And so whatever you're belittling yourself about or whatever you don't think you're adequate doing, just relax. God gives you a dream. Wherever you are, you claim that in the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus. And then wait for it. Well, actually, actually wait for it to happen, but get ready for it to happen. Yes. You start learning the skills or whatever it is, because I dreamed that I'd speak someday, and, and I couldn't, I was so sick in my stomach that I couldn't brush my teeth on the morning that I was about to speak at some place, because I was so nervous about it, because I knew I was going to goof up. And so, what is it? It's just a matter of learning some skills. And you practice those things, and you go to the expert speakers, and you figure out what they're doing, and just dumb it down to a sixth grade level. <laughs> so that's kind of an introduction I've given for a lot of years. So anyway, thanks for inviting me, and, and then thanks for inviting the, both of us here, because she's got a ton of wisdom, and, uh, and, and she's the one that, I'm the dreamer, she's the dream maker. I've got, a, I've got a list of four and a half pages of outstanding qualities of why she's so valuable. She is worth so much more than, than this $2 million stone. I carry it around. Many people don't know it's worth $2 million, uh, But I carry it around. But she's worth like billions, trillions of value to me. And so that I have the list that I can prove to you why she's so valuable. What kind of mom she is, what kind of an accountant she is. She has kept me safe from the IRS for 50 years. <laughs> she would like to be audited someday because she knows they're going to give her a blue ribbon because it's done well. I, I turn in a receipt to get reimbursed. I can't get reimbursed from her unless I fill it out right. <laughs> she's my wife, for heaven's sakes. So, uh, yeah, she's like a fiduciary, responsible banker. And so that, that she does finances for different people from time to time. And I'll say, hey, what do you, what do you know about them? <laughs> I want to tell you a thing about them or their money, you know, because she wants to be trusted, and she's highly trusted to the point that my kids, adult kids, 40, 45, 47, they would love it if she did their finances because they know it would be done right. But I got all a list of how valuable she is. Now, this is the reason I mentioned this. I want to get close to the edge here so I can whisper to you almost. Jesus said, whatever you treasure, that's where your heart will be. 
Okay, what are you treasuring? What's very important to you? Because that's where your heart's going to be. Well, she's very important to me. My three kids are very important to me. My ten grandkids are very important to me. My friends outside my family are important to me. But you are also important to me. Very important. I would rather be with you today than fishing anywhere in the world. I'd rather be with you than golfing anywhere because I'm a horrible golfer. So uh, I don't really want to be there anyway. So, uh, but I love you because you're warm and breathing. That's it. That's the only qualification you have to have. Anybody here not warm and breathing? Okay, so I love you. And why do I love you? Is because I value you. You cannot love people. Romans 12.10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, preferring one another in <gasps> honor. Honor means that person is very valuable to you. Tomorrow morning when you wake up and you look at your mate, you go, yay! I can't even believe I'm in the same room with the most valuable man or woman on earth. <gasps> I am not worthy. I am not. Hey, here's the interesting thing about this. You make your list and start today. Watch how your affections increase daily. But what do most of us do as humans? <sighs> of all the people on earth to marry, I got this one. And then you go through a list of all the things that irritate you bother you, frustrate you, overwhelm you, right? That's what we're thinking about. That's dishonor. So whatever you dishonor is you lose your affection in your heart for that person. So every, I could spend three days talking about how important every one of your thoughts are. Your thoughts determine who you are. Above all else, Proverbs, guard your heart because out of your heart flows the wellspring of who you are. Hey, I'm going to say something right here that is going to blow your mind, some of you. And you're, you're probably, I could, the potential is you're going to shut down on me. You might not even listen to me the rest of this time. I don't even know how much time I have. How much time do I have? Oh, it's more than I need. So when I see you dropping off to sleep or leaving, then I know we're done. So, but anyway, okay, listen to how powerful this is. I'm sorry to have to say this to you because some of you have held on to anger your entire life and you're mad at somebody. And anger is fear, frustrate. Well, here it is. Anger is fear, frustration, and hurt feelings. Okay? Who is this? The Hulk. What makes him green? Anger. He gets hacked. Okay? Everybody gets hacked every day. I've never met anybody that doesn't get hacked. Anger is in our world. Ephesians 4.26 says, Go ahead and get angry. That's just, God made us this way and this reality. Go ahead and get angry. What's anger? Fear, worry, jealousy, envy, uh, frustration. How many of you have been frustrated at least once today? Frustrated about something. Traffic, the, your car, your house, how much money you make or don't make, uh, your boss, your mate, your kids. How many have kids? How many have been frustrated at least once this week about your kids? It can be daily. It can be hourly. Amen? Frustration is okay. Irritation. I've been irritated with your mate or your kids at least once this week. Okay? Irritate. It's good to get irritated. You can get irritated. Because you know what irritation is? I love this. You know what irritation is? It's simply the speck in their eye reflecting the honking log in your own eye. <laughs> I hate to say that, but that's true. That's Jesus' words, Matthew 7. You're all upset with your mate or your kids or your friends or your boss or your some pastor. Yeah. Yeah, they get upset with you once in a while. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's so normal. 
But thank God for your irritations in your life. Don't try to get rid of them. They're simply there to show you where you need to improve. You're the one with the honking logs in your eyes. So the next time your wife irritates you, say, honey, thank you for being such an irritation to me. Because God is using you to show me where I need to improve. You know, I used to say to my kids, thank you for making me angry. I need you in my life. And they'd go, what? What did you say again? Because they didn't get it at first, but they got it today. And they know that we as a family made our living based on the things that frustrated us, irritated us, upset us, the trials we went through. All your trials are awesome. My wife's main message is that there is a pearl in every pile. You know what that pile is? Yeah. Cow. Uh, Okay, she uses the word, but I usually don't use it in church. And so, uh, but do you know that we have never, we have never found the exception of not being able to find a pearl or a ruby or a platinum or something of value in every one of our trials. Therefore, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18 says, rejoice, again I say rejoice, which means yay, it's cheering. Rejoice is cheering, yay, for that trial. Do you think you feel like saying yay for a trial? No, nobody feels like it. You don't do it because you feel like it. Your feelings come after your thoughts. I never feel like thanking God when she irritates me. And there is not a day that goes by that we do not irritate each other or frustrate each other. On the way here, (laughs) she said to me, we are too early. The schedule says you're to be here at 930, not 15 after 9. I said, I'm just going early to find it, and then we're going to turn around and go get some water some distilled water from my sleeping machine that I have to sleep. I look like I'm in intensive care every night. And so uh, anyway, but we got here and ran into all, some of the leaders and everybody said, go ahead and just stay. In fact, one of the leaders said, I'll go and get your distilled water. I said, good for you. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Serving church. Okay, so the point of this thing, introduction, is that you're flawed and I'm flawed. Yeah. Your personality is different than mine. But I love you, and I love your personality, and I'm just going to figure out where God needs to to bless you and enrich your life and make you whole like he designed us to be whole. But I'm not going to judge you and say you're wrong and I'm right. And I'm going to accept you, and I'm going to love you no matter what because you're valuable to me. And I'm not going to let you make me angry. You can frustrate me today. You can irritate me and cause me to be jealous or envious today, but I ain't keeping it in me. Okay? Because guess what? The number one tool that I can see through my young life, the number one tool of Satan is to get you angry and keep you angry. You can get angry, but you cannot let the sun go down on your anger. So every night I download my anger into the trash and I just say, Lord, thank you for that junk that happened today. Some of it's big, some of it's smaller, but just thank you, Lord, because there's a pearl in every pile. And so just I'll find it one of these days, but I know it's there, so I'm relaxed. But I forgive them. I forgive that person or that group. They promised this. They lied. They did this. That company did this to me, this, da, 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 da. I'd like to give you the name of the company that humiliated me two weeks ago in Southern California. It's a very popular, wealthy company, and I was shocked at how they were treating me, and I felt like they were discriminating me because I'm 73 and that I don't understand techie things. So I took my techie things in to get them fixed, and they humiliated me. And I I was shocked. I thought, my gosh, this cannot be happening by this company. I'd love to tell you the news. See, <laughs> we get a little bit of revenge, but no, I'm not going to do that. Because, you know, it was a younger guy, about 27 or so, and he just very techy, and he just thought I was an idiot. And I actually am in some ways with techy stuff, but okay. 
But the point is, is that it offended me. And before I drove back to our hotel, I forgave him. I said, Lord, he's flawed. I'm flawed. What am I going to judge him? And so I don't go, I don't wake up the next morning angry at anybody or anything. I get it out of my life. So I'm a professional forgiver. And I'm also a professional seeker of forgiveness. So she knows that if I'm going to offend her, she tells me about it, she knows I'm going to seek forgiveness from her. And, and same thing with my kids. I have a younger son who's a lot like me, and we irritate each other to the max. <laughs> and he's 40, and he's got a more successful company than I. You know what he does? He's got ER for love. It's an emergency room for couples who are getting a divorce. I just went through his course this past Thursday. Thursday and Friday, with his wife, who was, I couldn't even believe how well they organized and the manual and stuff with this thing. And we, we, we had a couple that was so fouled up, they hated each other, they hadn't touched each other in 10 years. And in two days, this couple fell into each other's arms, and, and they text us a picture of themselves in bed with the sheet up above their shoulders. <laughs> And it was like phenomenal. <laughs> it was such a picture of what can happen. This is a couple that could hardly, could hardly be in the same room with each other. And they both forgave each other. And they understood what it meant. And then they valued each other really highly over a two-day period. But the way they've organized it is just amazing. They turn couples around in a day. They have 85% success in what they do. A day. It's called ER for Love, and you can get to their website because he took my website, and uh, and I when we left our staff go, he took all of our stuff, our web thing and everything, our books and everything. So GarySmalley.com goes. He's a real techie person, so it all goes to his stuff, and then he pays us every month, which we love. I don't have to do either work. And so, but anyway, that's my son. So you can get there. If you know of somebody who's on a thread in their marriage, they can be turned around in a day. And he's got these ER for Love centers all over the country. And he's got them. He's the, first, the, last, the last one he's doing is in South Africa. So now you want, you know what his dream is? Have one in every city in the world. Okay. Does he think all things are possible through Christ? Yeah, he saw his dad that couldn't do a thing and could, it was impossible for me to do any things I did. He saw it happen. He watched it happen. And so he knows this is very important to get out of your life. And we were disagreeing two years ago in a major thing. And he said, Dad, stop. Okay, relax. He said, remember, we both highly honor each other. So this is going to be solved soon. He has a method of communication where... When you use it as a couple, you can't get a divorce because it immediately eliminates. It's called love, L-O-U-V, talk. But they've just redefined what that, oh, my gosh. I learned it for the first time on Thursday and Friday. And I thought, oh, jeez. And so it's so well done. So you can use it as a family, too. You can be in disharmony with your son or your daughter or whatever. And you start using it and watch the harmony start to flow in your family. So these tools are available today because here's the key. This is my message today. Keep this as low as possible every day. This as high as possible every day with people. Amen? amen. I love a church that says amen. What a church you have here. It's really good. Okay, so back to... Back to, uh, I could mention this too. This book, Joy That Lasts, is here. I didn't know what was going to show up. Joy That Lasts is how to turn everything positive, honor everything that happens to us, uh, how to turn everything negative, I'm sorry, into a positive. This is the six things they, my other son learned in his research of how to turn a marriage around in four days. It's called the DNA of relationships. It's got that same communication method in it, but just explained a little bit differently. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the love of my life. This is four things that Jesus said that summarizes all of his teachings, 50-some teachings, 
And when you get yourself as a parent and your kids to learn and memorize these four verses, four things he said, watch what happens to your family. So, gosh, would I love to spend the rest of the day talking about that. But this is what I came for, see? When you get old, you stumble once in a while and fall off the stages and so on. Not yet. So, anyway. Okay, my wife and I are very different. See this little finger? It looks similar to that one. It's a little bit bigger still. But a year ago or so, I cut it off. And the only thing that was holding it was a little piece of skin right here. It was just dangling there, bleeding. What I did was I was doing a honey-do list for her in the backyard, and I had a drill, a corded drill, the long shaft drill thing. You, it's an infomercial on TV. You, you buy these things, it drills a hole real fast. You put the plan in, you know, it's really, it's really fast. The only thing they didn't explain to you, or they may have, I missed it, ADHD, uh, is when you run into a stone or, or a, 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 a root, it, it doesn't cut well. Okay, and so I'm drilling the, the, the second to the last hole, and it hits a root or whatever it hit, and it jumps out of my hand. Okay, instinctively, I never thought this through, I grabbed it <laughs> as it was falling, so the shaft. Well, the, I pushed the button in the process of, of whatever happened, and it was the button that keeps it running. The cord, four seconds is about all this took. The cord wrapped around the shaft, ripped my finger off, and I couldn't get it off. So it was just like horrible pain. And so I ran to get to where the plug was and unplugged it. And but there it is. So I unwrapped it, took the glove off, and there was my finger hanging down. I have pictures of it if you want to see it. It's here. <laughs> I actually do. And, uh, but anyway, so, uh, so almost one of my initial emotions was to laugh. Because I went, <laughs> only Smalley would cut his finger off with a cord. I mean, how many of you, you ever heard of anybody who's cut their finger off with a cord? And so, uh, anyway, no one raises their hand. And so, anyway, <laughs> I run into the house really fast because I realize this is an emergency. So I go to the cupboard, I pull a bowl out, I put water and ice in it, wrap my finger in a little bit of r raggy thing as fast as I could. I put my finger, hand in the water, got in the car, started driving to work, called her. I said, hon, I just got the end of my finger off. She goes, oh. well, part of the oh, was that I was interrupting her schedule. <laughs> she has a daily schedule. I mean, she wants to go through that schedule, which is a natural thing of her personality. I mean, she didn't say that to me. I'm just imagining in my mind as I'm driving to, to think, okay, so I get to the hospital, the emergency room, and we drive in at the exact same time. And personality differences, okay? The first thing she says when she goes, she goes, oh, that's my favorite bowl. <laughs> it was her favorite bowl. So one of the little chickens on the side that we got on a vacation one time. And of course, see, that irritated me initially because I thought, finger? And so I, I, I wanted to go, whoops. You know, but uh, I didn't, okay? And so I kind of smiled inside, and then, I, then we went in, and they sewed it back on. They said, 50-50 chance, and there it is. Okay, so we prayed. Called one of my friends who has the gift of healing, and uh, God, he prayed for me. And then he called me back and said, guess what? Your finger's pink. I said, go, oh, way to go. Okay, because the doctors didn't know. Okay, so, but that's the different personality. So just imagine us, 49 years of marriage, Every day, at some point, irritating each other. That's anger. And it's okay to get angry. Just don't stay angry. Amen. You forgive each other as soon as you can. And if you can't, you ask God to empower you if you can't do it because you've been angry in the past. And, and, um, and the problem with anger in the past is that, is that the more anger you store in your heart... It's like storing a, I just thought of this this week, of a different, I got to bring one, not a live one, but bring a, you know, fake one, a rubber kind of thing, but it's a bow constrictor. Anger is a bow, it's a, what's another way to say that? It's, it's a, what kind of snake is that? Python. Yeah, I want to bring a python one of these days, maybe even a miniature, just so people can see it. Because guess who suffers when you get offended and you stay angry? The offender or you? 
You know what it's like to stay angry? It's like drinking poison and then saying, God, make the person who offended me sick. <laughs> Stupid, isn't it? I'll just name a few of them from memory. If you stay angry, it's not that you get angry, it's if you stay angry, you are going to move into darkness and you cannot know God, his love, and you don't have any desire for his word and for fellowship with Christians. That's one. Two, you sabotage your relationships. If you are married to an angry person today, it'll be a tough road trying to get this person to love you. Because they will sabotage your attempts. What kind of marriage is that? Or friendship or parenting relationship? You can't do it. You have to get the anger out of you. I could spend days explaining how I've done it over the years. It's your job. You got to go to God and to books and Google, you know, and find out what works and ask your friends who's an expert at forgiveness here in this church? Who's an expert? There you go. There's one. Okay, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Look how many are experts here. How many of you have really been offended in life in one way or another? Okay? All right. Now, many of you have learned how to forgive. Either you learn how to forgive or you live a miserable life. (laughs) It's up to you. So the thing I was going to say a little while ago that some of you will not want to hear is that you are 100% responsible for the quality of your own life. You can be married to a real jerk. It's your responsibility to stay happy with God and, and, and to have the high quality of life because guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Your thoughts hidden into your heart As a man or woman thinks in her heart, so is she. Guard your heart above all things, because out of it flows the wellspring of who you are. Jesus said, out of your heart flows your thoughts, words, and actions. Look at Matthew 15. Where do those thoughts, words, and actions come from? Your heart. What's your heart made of of your millions of thoughts you've had? during your lifetime. You have a, the average person has a billion thoughts in their lifetime. Look at, uh, look at the Carol, have you ever read of Caroline Leaf, her books on neuro, neuro, uh, sur, uh, neuro, neurology? She's a neuroscientist. She ex- started play, explaining that to me about five, six, seven years ago. I had a meeting with her and, and questioned her and she explained it to me. Smalley, don't blame... Uh, for 38 years, I actually blamed you, didn't I, for my quality of life. <laughs> Moi. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so, but after 38 years, my son Greg finally said to me one day, Dad, stop lecturing Mom and trying to change her because it'll never work. You never change a person by lecturing them. Because what you do is you create an unsafe home, and then they get worse in their relationship with you, not better. Who can you change, Dad, Mom or you? I said, me. I'm the only one I can change. He says, well, then why are you still working on Mom? Because I had a belief back then that if she changed a couple areas of her life, I'd be happier. That's a lie from the pit. I'm happy today because God's words live inside of me. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. What does it say in Ephesians 3, 16 through 20? God, please, out of your unlimited resources in heaven, please grant me strength with power through your Holy Spirit abiding within me so that Christ may dwell in my heart rooting and grounding me in your love. Oh, gosh, I could go on to that section because it's so amazing. Who is the quality of my life today? Jesus. His words are alive and powerful and sharper. than. That's what this is all about. This is memorizing just four verses and then meditating on them every day because those are your thoughts. And so my heart's being... I have... Your, your heart's full of a lot of warehouses 
full of all the thoughts that you've had throughout your life, and those thoughts go to various warehouses that are different, and then they recycle themselves back up to your mind. So if you want to have a different thoughts, if you want to be quality of life, then you build new warehouses. You're responsible for that. Not that person's fault that you're unhappy. That's the lie. Satan can get us to believe that lie. Then we go around blaming people, complaining. You know what complaining is? God, you are a liar. All things don't work together for good. That's, that's your song you sang today. And you wrote. You write all the worship songs in here? Because yeah, I heard the theme of love. and you, Okay, excellent. You got a pastor that writes through the song. So, uh, but what an excellent song that was. Well, it's because God gives his love to the humble. And a humble person is a person who just says, I'm flawed. I need God in my life for quality. I can't do this stuff alone. And the miracles that you're going to provide in my life, God, are just amazing. So I fall before you and thank you for life. And thank you that you've written. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to speak your Father's words to us so that I could memorize them and that I then become like you. Because I think your thoughts. I think your thoughts. That's pretty simple, isn't it? See, that's sixth grade stuff. Huh? And so, therefore, that's my job every day. Memorizing his word and med meditating on it. So I started today with my five, four verses. <laughs> five, four verses. <laughs> Matthew 5, 3. Uh, I, I, I'm poor in spirit. I'm like a beggar. And I get the kingdom of heaven given to me. Secondly, I love people like Jesus did. And when I do that, 1 John chapter 2 says, my love for God is made complete. So I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's that mean? That means I like Him and want Him a lot more than all the stuff the world offers. Homes, cars, money, all that stuff. It's important. It's okay. I can get it. But I want Him more. And he knows that. And then guess what the fourth one is? Ladies and gentlemen, the fourth one is rejoice. Matthew 5, uh, 10, 11, and 12. Rejoice in your difficulties, your persecutions, your hardships, your, your trials, your uncomfortable, your irritations, your worries. You know why I don't worry anymore? Because a pastor about a month ago said to me, well, to the congregation. He said, Jesus says, don't worry about anything. Because the birds, uh, I'm take, God's taking care of it. Don't worry about anything. He, here's what he said. He said, turn your worries into concerns. So what I do is I say, God, I'm really concerned about that thing that's going to maybe happen. I'm concerned about it. Because a worry is fearing something that may never happen. And so something in the future, <gasps> that could happen to me. So if it happens to you, he's going to take it and give you the pearls of love and all the other pearls that are involved in it. So you're going to win. He's going to cause all things to work together for your good, okay, and to his glory and to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, which is to love others. So... Uh, so if I think about something bad is going to happen to me, and there is something right now that potentially could be bad, but I've already said, God, it's a concern. And so I hand it over to you, and I'll let you take care of it. And I got a little sticker on my desk that says something like, um, stop your worries today because I'm in charge. I'm, I'm watching over you. I'm taking care of you. It's my job. Just have a good day. So I turn my worries into concerns, hand them to God, and say, you bring the peace and the wisdom when I need it. Yes. And then I rest. Yes. And so then I don't wake up every morning going, <gasps> <gasps> or <gasps> they did that to me. <gasps> they might do that to me. But they did it, or they might, or they're doing it. It's all the same. Yeah. He's going to use it. And... If anybody has any questions about that, ask my wife because she's, she's lived with a trial her entire 49 years. And 
What has that done for her? It's blessed her. Because I don't wake up in the morning and say, how can I frustrate my wife today? <laughs> Nobody does that, usually, unless you're angry. <laughs> then you might. But, uh, but the point of this whole thing is, is this right here. Keep your anger level low. Let's say it together. Keep your anger level low. Your honor level high. And that simply means making a list, mental or written, it's better written, of all the reasons why this person is so valuable. And if you've got a father or a mother that you hate, and you, it nauseates you to think about making a list of what, why they're valuable, the first, you start with this, they gave you life. You're alive. That's one. It's big positive. And then secondly, whatever else you can think of. Oh, oh, and I'll finish with this. Uh, um, I talked to an African-American, 35-year-old, good-looking guy last week in California. He's got a ministry called Fatherhood Matters. His dad uh, had him when he was not married. And so, uh, but as soon as he had him, he left. And so he's never known his dad. He's called him several times. He won't talk to him. And, and so, you know, it's hurt him really deeply. But he's got a ministry now called Fatherhood Matters, which is because he knows how much he needed a dad. And even now he calls him. And guess what his dad is now doing? His dad's a pastor. He still won't spend any time with him. And so I said, does that really hurt you? He says, ugh. He says, it's so discouraging. Because he's in full-time ministry now helping dads. I says, why is that valuable to you that your dad is the way he is? He went, huh? I said, have you ever called your dad and thanked him for the dad that he is? And he said, no, I, I don't feel like calling my dad and thanking him for being the dad he is. <laughs> I said, why? I said, you know how valuable your dad is to you? He says, no, tell me some reasons. <laughs> I said, why do you do what you do today? Because of the way your dad treated you. If he hadn't been the dad he is, you'd never want to do this. And you're helping all these dads all over the country. And his, his dream is to help dads all over the world. I said, where'd that passion come from? Because of the pain you experienced. He went, yes. I said, can you understand and feel with sons who don't have their dad? Yes. He tears in his eyes. Yes. Where'd you get those tears? From your dad. He went, oh. I never thought of that. And so before he went to bed that night, he forgave his dad, 35 years old, spent four years in prison because uh, of his, he gives all kinds of reasons why he, his dad went there and stuff, you know. But he said, now, I said, you got an education being in prison. What an awesome experience. He says, oh, I know what all they feel. I know how to be healed in that situation. I went, those are all gifts from your dad, for heaven's sakes. He started getting so excited, so he forgave his dad, and then he called the two leaders of this conference and said, I can't go to sleep without telling you, I love my dad tonight for the first time in my life, and I'm so excited about talking to him. So he called him the next day and thanked him, and his dad still didn't want to talk to him. Hey, it's an ongoing trial that God is giving him more and more understanding and wisdom, and he'll figure out how to solve this for himself. One of these days, he's going to lead his... He's a past dad's a pastor. I was going to say one of these days, he's going to lead his dad to Christ. And he might. <laughs> you know. So I don't know, but he's a sharp kid. You're going to see him in action one of these days, probably. But anyway, point is, find out what God's teaching you through these difficult things that you're experiencing. Gosh, I'm not sure how long I have, but let's, I might as well pray. Yeah. One? I have one more story I could tell. Okay, all right. I'm going to overdo my welcome. My son, when Greg, when he was about six or seven, 
There was a rule in my home, nobody screams when I'm on the phone because I didn't want people to think that my family was out of control. And so, uh, anyway, he was screaming one time and I'm on the phone with a pastor and I'm trying to talk to this pastor and he's screaming and jumping up and down the, in the room I was in. And so I was trying to get you to And so I said, something's come up, you can hear it. I said, I'll call you right back. And so I hung up and I grabbed him by the phone. I said, you were screaming when I'm on the phone. I told you, you know there's no screaming when I'm on the phone. He's still crying, screaming, jumping up and down. I shove him. He hits the ground. I said, you get in your bedroom right now. So we got the stick that he made and decorated and stuff, you know, and because uh, he was our strong-willed child. And, uh, and I didn't spank him that often, but once in a while. And so anyway, I was going to spank him, so I gave him a couple of swats, and then I stood up, and, and then he stood up, still crying, and looked at me with that look of, I hate you. And I could, and instantaneously this came to my mind. This is a very valuable kid. And what a precious son he is today. But six or seven years old, I could see what was happening. He was really frustrated with me and hurt, fearful, discouraged, just felt degraded. And I could see it all over his face. And so I instantly knew what's going on here. If he stays angry with dad, then we're going to have problems when he's a teenager. And because uh, that's when the really the anger comes out and acting out. And so, so I dropped to my knees immediately because I used to go through five things every time I offended her or any of my kids. I would get really soft real fast. I would massively increase understanding, number two. Three, I would try to understand, and then I would admit when I, when I understood why they were offended. And then four, I'd try to touch as soon as I could, because touching a person that you've just offended will tell you how much is there, because if you start to touch them, they say, don't, don't touch me. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Fend your wife, you try to grab her hand. You're in bed, tip those feet over. Get those feet over. Right? That's usually a sign of a lot of anger. So, uh, so, and the fifth thing I would do was seek forgiveness. You may not be able to, but could you forgive me? Because I'm flawed, and I, I know I screwed up here, and so I'd just love to ask you for forgive me. I really understand. If you really understand it, and you've listened and understood it, then you get tears. Sometimes you get tears in your eyes because you realize you, what you've done. So, and that's what's really important. So, anyway, I dropped to my knees. I mean, I got really soft, and I, I, I handed him the stick right off, and I said, Craig, I don't even know why you were crying. And he took the stick and dropped it and backed up further, and I said, You know, I'm the one that needs to be spanked. After I heard why he is crying, he fell in the bathroom tile, slipped with the water, he was taking a bath, and he hit his ear on the bathtub, and it was bleeding. So you know what happens when you hit your ear in a bathtub? It hurts like crazy. And so he was crying, jumping up and down. That makes sense. I didn't ask that. And so I, when I found out, I went, oh, my gosh. I said, I can't believe I did that, Greg. You are way too valuable to treat like this. And I said... I said, I am so sorry. I understand. That was the third thing. And then the fourth thing is I wanted to touch him, but I knew he wasn't going to touch me because you can tell when they're not open and ready to touch you. So I said, I skipped to number five, and I said, you probably can't do this, Greg, and I would sure understand it if you can't, but Daddy would so love it if you could forgive me. And he ran to my arms and threw his arms around me and we fell back on the bed. <gasps> you know, they are <gasps> and like that. And I'm patting him and I look at his ear. Oh, I see the blood. And I went, oh my gosh, are you sure you've forgiven daddy? And he pats me. He says, oh, daddy, we all make mistakes. <laughs> huh? As low as possible every day. Get it out. And both of you. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We love you for your, well, you are the creator. You're everything. You are our water, our living water, our living bread, our front shield, our rear guard. 
You are a thousand things that we read about in the scriptures, and you're everything we'll ever need. That's why we love you with all of our heart. We have all this stuff that you provided, but we don't count on it for life. You're our life. If anything, it's overflow, or if anything, it causes stress, more stress anyway. So the less we have of it many times, the better anyway. I just thank you for who you are and sending your son to live within us, his words to be living within us, alive, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, wisdom. Just thank you for salvation. Thank you for this church, each person here. Maybe there's new people here who don't know you. Father, draw them by your spirit to you today so they can know what we know, that you forgive. You put all of our sins in the past. You throw them in the ocean. They, 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 they float down to the, to the 20,000 feet level and beyond. And you don't remember them anymore. You forgive us yesterday, today, and for, forever because of your pain on the cross and your stripes. We're healed. And Father, I just pray that you will richly bless this church amazingly with their conferences they have coming up in the future, the, the, the marriage summit they want to have. Lord, just answer their prayers. Give them the power to free each other from anger. It's okay to get angry every day, but don't keep it inside, Lord. Help them get it out. Even 20 years ago or 30 or 40 years ago, stuff that happened to them. Let them see the value of what happened, of how you're using it. You're at work, as our pastor saying today. You're working hard to bless us because of our sufferings. And I do pray for salvation today.